Good evening, uh, church. Uh, this is uh, our Wednesday word for May 10th, 2023. Today we will be covering uh, from the book of Daniel uh, the vision of the four beasts found in verses 1 through 8. There are some conflicting uh, opinions and interpretations for what uh, what exactly these verses are saying. The way that uh, there's some things that can be ambiguous. There's some things that you can go, okay, well, we can have some leeway in how we might view this. And there's others, other aspects where the, the text itself tells us what it is. And I notice sometimes uh, we get more in alignment by knowing what something isn't than what something is. And in this chapter, we're going to run into texts that while we may not know exactly what it's referring to, we can rule out certain things and say that it's not referring to this. And so with that in mind, I'm going to go to our next slide here. And these are the first couple of verses in chapter 7 uh, where Daniel has his dream of, of the four beasts. Uh, I'll go ahead and read the first two verses here. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told of the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Uh, there's been different comments about what that might be. Uh, in literal terms, the great sea was often used at that time to refer to the Mediterranean Sea, but we know sometimes seas are used in a symbolic sense of chaos. differing people groups of chaos. I know in Revelation, where it talks about the waters upon which the harlots sit, that they were different nations, tribes, <laughs> tongues, languages. So this could be talking, and this would certainly fit here, uh, the, the conflicts of the nations. Because uh, he's talking about four kings that are going to arise, and you're going to see uh, a view of, of uh, international conflict of kings that are rising and falling, kingdoms that come together in different configurations, different ways. And Daniel was describing things that we're going to see that he couldn't just come out and say, uh, this, this vision is about Russia, this vision is about the United States. Uh, but he had to use language that would have been familiar to himself and the original readers that he would be addressing uh, back in, in the 6th century B.C. Right. Uh, one interpretation of the four winds is that it is an, the four winds are the angelic powers. The angelic powers. Which would make sense in that ultimately God is in supervision over all the history. And that doesn't mean that good people and bad people don't play their part, but God has a bigger picture view and is ultimately... Uh, in his eternal decree, he can allow a nation to rise or cast a nation down. And the, the immediate history that we study will show uh, different historical figures doing different things, but God sees the big picture here. And so Daniel's getting this vision of, of this great conflict of, of nations rising and falling. Uh, and so that's that's what's happening here. Uh, and in, when we go to verse 3 here, he starts talking more about these four great beasts. And by four great beasts, we could assume that this is talking not just of some obscure nation arising and doing something, but that these beasts are symbolic for major powers that were going to arise upon the earth here. So, Pastor Chris, I'll let you go and read verses 3 and 4 here. And four great beasts 
came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And I beheld, uh, behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. And after this I beheld, and another, like unto a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So we see the ten horns again. Uh, and then Ending in verse 8 here, And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. We're going to see more of this little horn. This little horn here plays a very important role in Bible prophecy and today won't be the last session we'll talk about. It. It's going to come up in some future sessions. Uh, so this is just the, the description of, of, of these kingdoms here. And uh, in the next several slides, we're going to go into interpretation of it. Uh, and in the interpretation, we're going to see that there are several different schools of thought as to what these four nations might be. In our first slide here, we're seeing a bird's eye view here of the four beasts in, in Daniel 7. Of course, the first one is like a lion. It has eagle's wings. Uh, the wings were later plucked. The lion was lifted from the earth and a man's heart given to it, suggesting that whatever nation or group of nations this represents, that uh, it partakes to itself at a later time in its history, a more civilized tone, a less barbarous tone. Then we see the second one is like a bear, raised up on its side, uh, suggesting that it may be a two-part empire of sorts with one side being dominant over the other. Uh, it had three ribs in its mouth. So maybe that could be that there were three other nations it was devouring and it had a mandate to devour much flesh. So uh, a nation that could meet this description would be any nation that has had in its history the ability to conquer large territories. We're look, yeah, we're looking at a, at a conquest of, of other nations, of three nations. And then the third one is like a leopard, and it said it had four fowl's wings, and it had four heads, and was given dominion. So a nation that might fit this would be a nation or a group of nations that there are four discernible heads or sub-nations underneath of uh, what would be a composite. Uh, one example uh one could think of Western civilization having different heads. If you look at Europe, you know, you have the French civilization, Spanish, Italian, but they're all European. And, you know, similar analogies can be made of countries in the Middle East that are distinct and yet they're part of a larger yeah. civilizational fabric. Yeah, we were having a conversation before we began this uh, recording that... Uh, these could represent so many different nations, um, the way that you look at it. They're, one thing, well, one thing that you had brought up was, you know, there could be uh, diverging interpretations um, because there's different routes that uh, the course of history could take to get to that same 
Um, the way that I, when I look at this, you see the symbolism. A winged lion is was the, say, the patron beast, if you will, of Babylon. And so, as this is like a lion, I believe that it is to be like Babylon, right? So then, like a bear would be like under Persia, and how Persia was a a an empire that conquered other peoples, um, multiple peoples. And interesting there, as you go through these symbolisms, is some of you will notice that these could be applied to multiple nations. Uh, you could apply Persia had conquered multiple peoples underneath its umbrella. Uh, there are some commentators that believe that this could be Russia, and Russia had the similar uh, situation in their national history. Mo the last instance was the Soviet Union in which uh, under the banner of the Soviet Union, Russia controlled numerous other nations within its uh, own domain. Um and then, of course, you know, we have the leopard with the fowl's wings. So there's differing uh, nations that this could be applied to uh, as we interpret. And because of that, there are different schools of thought of where people think that this is talking about where it's going. One of the things that uh, I've noted is that uh, there seem to be two streams of interpretation that we bring up a lot. And that lead to the same mm -hmm. end game. Right. The the winged leopard, uh, I believe, is like a leopard, uh, is uh, representing a like a the Greek Empire. So it's not... While there is some similarities between the four beasts and the four metals of Daniel 2, of the statue of Daniel 2, the difference is, is Daniel 2 is giving us this big, long timeline. Um, this is speaking of four kingdoms or four kings in the future's tense, right? So then this would be, and just as the lion is, it's like, like a lion, it's like Babylon, the like a bear, like Persia, right? like a leopard, would be like the Alexandrian yeah. Greek Empire. And then we get into the fourth beast, which, and we're going to show this as we go forward, the fourth beast is a conglomeration of the three. Yes. Which is symbolic of conquest. There's great war. The bear is the, is the, uh, is given the, uh, mandate to devour flesh that is yeah. to wage war um the lion prior the winged lion is uh what is given a man's heart which here's something that we we have to recognize let me kind of spend a little time on this so to the modern idea when you say heart in the metaphorical sense you're thinking of one's capacity for empathy or compassion mm -hmm. right and while in the ancient world it would include that, it, 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 it would include what we would also today consider our, the logos, the, the, the ability to um, uh, reason. And this would be even more true in the Hebrew and the Aramaic. Right. Now, there's an interesting comparison when you compare the great commandments. Uh, Moses' version said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, uh, all thy soul and all thy strength. We don't see the word mind there because heart covers mind. Right. But by the time you get to uh, the Greek civilization, uh, the Greco-Roman civilization, uh, 1,500 years after Moses, when Jesus then rephrases that, he adds the words, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind, and all thy strength. So there's you have the extra term there because by that time, heart was, the, the definition was more towards the emotional and right. the pathological, whereas the mind was the intellectual. But uh, in more ancient times, 
the heart covered both the intellectual uh, right. faculty and the capacity for emotion. Right. The winged leopard is giving dominion over the three. And at some point between the three, the, the third beast and the fourth beast, there's some great war. Is the way that the text, um, and, and from that comes this beast, this beast system that wins out over and consumes and and incorporates within itself the other three, the previous three. Now, the, we're so far so good on all the interpretations. There's not really, we've not covered any area yet where there's divergencies. But as we go into the next slides, we're going to start discussing some of them because of some of the things on there. Now, this next slide here, uh, it's titled The Four Kingdoms of Daniel, and the creator of that slide holds to an interpretation that became common in the Middle Ages, and it's still a very popular one, if not the most popular one. In this interpretation, it assumed that there is a perfect symmetry between the Four Kingdoms and Daniel 7 and the statue in Daniel 2. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to cover it and then in a few more slides show why this needs to be corrected somewhat. Uh, and in this interpretation, the head of gold uh, corresponds perfectly to the winged line that is Babylon. And of course, that was fueled by the fact that if you look at the symbiology of Babylon, their national animal was a winged lion. Right. And then... Uh, the bear uh, represents Persia, as in literally Persia. The leopard represents literal Greece. And then the, uh, the fierce beast, the, the monstrous beast, that's the fourth beast, represents the Roman Empire. Now, there is one wrinkle to that interpretation where some commentators will extend that to being the Roman Catholic Church and that particular polemic was common in the early history of the Reformation, right. where uh, commentators transferred all the prophetic destinies of the Roman Empire to the Roman Catholic Church. They proclaimed that the Pope was the beast, the Pope was the Antichrist, right. and that the key to coming out is to avoid the Catholic Church. Right. And if you're Catholic, come out of the Catholic system. Right. So I... I've heard that in in churches when I was a kid. I've I've heard this um, that explanation. I've I've heard the Catholic Church referred to as you know the you know Great Babylon and and you know the the system of the beast and that the Pope is the Antichrist. I've heard all of that. And if you read the Chick Tracks, it won't it'll use the word Great Whore. And for some reason, I don't know why he liked the term great whore. I've heard it called whore, harlot. Uh, and of course, uh, in this narrative, the Roman Catholic Church was the entire harlot. I, I believe they was actually thinking too small because the one world religious system is bigger than any one religious group. Uh, and as we I've talked about in the past, and when we get into Mystery Babylon, we're going to see that this religious system has tentacles in a large number of religious groups, uh, tentacles in every nation, and more so in the nations in the West than in the Russia, China, Islamist axis, but it has roots everywhere. Uh, well, if you watched the video where we broke down Daniel chapter 2 and the statue, you should have a pretty good idea where we're going to go with yeah. who we believe this the the fourth beast is okay but before we go into the other slides because they represent a, a different interpretation uh i want to share this text here it's a little bit later in the chapter but it shares why pastor chris and i do not regard the traditional interpretation to be entirely true as it's presented uh in daniel 7 15 to 7 we're, uh, we're going to find out that the four kings that this is talking about uh, are future kingdoms. And in verse 17, we're told that these represent four kings that will arise from the earth. 
Now, if the traditional interpretation is correct, then you have to account for this verse. Because one of the things that we should observe is that at the time Daniel received this vision, all four kingdoms in the traditional interpretation existed. Uh, Babylon existed, was at the height of its power falling. It was collapsing. Persia was about to take center stage. And Daniel's lifetime, he goes from being advisor to Babylon to being one of Persia. To give you an idea of where those two nations were. So Babylon and Persia were not kings that will arise. They were already on the scene. Greek was already on the scene as a series of city-states that would coalesce into the Alexandrian Empire a few centuries later. But Athens existed. Sparta existed. Uh, the kingdom of Macedon existed, uh, contemporary to Daniel. And then the Roman Empire, while it was not an empire at this time, the city of Rome was an actual contemporary city to Daniel. Yeah, it was a, it was a small city at the time. It, that was during the um, uh, monarchic period before the Republic. Yes. So... Uh, if, if this is referring to four kings who will arise, then we can rule out it being literally these four kingdoms that uh, we've just talked about. It's four future kingdoms that will arise. And as we go into some of the other texts here, we're going to see that those four kingdoms uh, are kingdoms that are either contemporary or in close proximity to themselves, but at a time future to Daniel. And so now we're going to get into, in our next slide here, an alternate interpretation. And it's not one universally held, obviously, but one interpretation that exists is that these four beasts are referring to beasts or to nations that are contemporary to us. Mm. Uh, and in this uh, understanding here, the line with eagle's wings would be the English-speaking world. The line would be Great Britain. The eagle's wings is the United States. The plucking off of the wings, the American Revolution. Uh, and in this interpretation, the bear is the Russian bear. And the mandate to conquer was the Soviet Union. I've even heard some commentators state, and I don't know that we could state it with this precision, but one commentator I once heard said that the nations was the nations of Lithuania and Latvia and... So, there's such a thing as reading the newspaper too much into. Well, that's that's exactly where this comes from. So, I'm, yeah. I do not at all subscribe to this interpretation. I do not believe that this is what that is. Um, I understand that it is uh, pretty common in certain circles. Yeah. Um, but I, I just don't see that, that that is how we should interpret it. Okay, and in, in this interpretation... Uh, they believe that the leopard is Germany, and they get it from the leopard tank. I think that's sort of dicey. Uh, of the three so far, probably the one that resonates most with people would be the line with the eagle's wings, and especially to the, those followers of prophecy that are Americans or people that come from English-speaking countries that resonates. Uh, we have to be careful that we're not looking at this through a modern lens yeah. but trying to look at it through the lens of when it was written right so from the modern lens we get the english lion yeah and the eagle's wings oh well yeah. english speaking yeah. world um the bear being the uh a, an animal symbolizing <laughs> russia which wasn't even a thing at that time right? um the leopard tank, uh, you know, that just, one's yeah, that one's that one's a bit that that the, that one's a bit of a stretch, and of course somebody could make the argument, you know, a, a, as we go into looking at some of the other interpretations, and I'll let you flesh out your interpretation here on how you believe that these beasts are like Babylon. Uh, right. Persia, Greece, and Rome, but not literally Babylon, right. Persia. So the 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 winged lion is the symbolic beast of Babylon, right? You go to any Babylonian 
ruins in Iraq, and you'll see murals and and uh, statues of winged lions, right? So when we go to the text, it says like a weak lion, right? If we we expolate from there, we see that this is this is a like a winged lion, as in like a Babylon, right? The uh, the bear, like a bear, is like a Persia. So this would be like a new Babylon, a new a new Persia, a new uh, Greek Empire, or a new Alexander. Um, when we then go to the, the the beast, which yes, it is a composite, right? And we uh, when we look at uh, the descriptions of the beast incorporates aspects of the previous three, right? That's where we're getting the composite. And in the next slide, we'll show the textual basis for that, right. you know. Uh, and of course, you know, playing the devil's advocate here in defense of this position, I could see somebody saying, well, uh, the line with the eagle's wings, England is kind of sort of like Babylon, Russia is kind of sort of like Persia, and Germany's kind of, sort of like um, uh, Greece. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily rule these out, but I'm inclined to agree with you that we don't want to dogmatically put the modern lens on it. Uh, what we can say is that there are three powers that will arise that are going to put in power the beast system. And I would like to read the uh, next slide here. Uh, and this is a textual basis for the idea that the beast is a composite of three empires. Right, uh, I want to read it and then show how the two different interpretations may not be as far removed as what it would seem on the surface. Uh, then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, and on its horns were ten diadem crowns, and on its heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast that I saw was like a leopard, but its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. The dragon gave the beast his power, his uh, throne, and great authority to rule. So we see we're not just uh, assuming that it's a composite. We know from the text in Revelation that uh, the imagery is pulling from Daniel, from the three beasts of Daniel. And I believe that the difference in the two interpretations, even though on the surface they would seem to be wide chasm, uh, may be narrower. Uh, and it relates to the nuance in the statue, uh, whether you interpret the statue in a conceptual manner of multiple powers coming together at the global scale to put in the beast or whether you're seeing the beast coming from a more local. Now, if you interpret this locally, then you can think of two or three powers emerging out of the Middle East, out of Turkey, out of the Turkic republics, uh, and that these uh, three beasts is another representation of the Ten Horns that brings the Antichrist in and brings in a Islamic. entity that would be called the global caliphate and this global caliphate then becomes the one world government. That's one way you can look at it. And so you have this one world Islamist government that's based out of the Middle East that either through intrigue or through massive war where the other more powerful countries become <laughs> decimated and the only power left is the powers in the Middle East. Right. Uh, I, I do. I actually don't see it as being too far fetched at all for that to happen. You have powers that be right now, right? The Eastern and Western powers poised for war, for global war. We, we haven't been this close to global war since World War II, in my opinion. Right. And the Middle East is poised to benefit either way. They're they're uh, especially Saudi Arabia, right? Yeah. 
And and Turkey is is on both sides of the fence. And playing both sides. Playing both sides. So if, if you have the Eastern and Western powers and they have this big global conflict and they're and and decimating one another and the Middle East then is able to amass a considerable amount of wealth from both sides, right? Fueling this war. You also take into account the massive Islamic uh, migrations into Europe and North America. Um, you take into account the Islamic communities, the uh, nearly two dozen uh, terrorist training camps that have been identified right here in the United States. Um, if you have uh, ec economic collapse mm -hmm. and uh, civil unrest and and before order can be reestablished and you have already established uh, cells that can seize towns or counties or uh, regions of a state or even an entire state, um, the south of France or, you know, uh, you know, uh, regions in, in England, um, you could see how this could result in or at least I can see easily how this could result in a global caliphate. It could be the catalyst for it. Well, one, where Russia's uh, almost decimated now. Russia's mm -hmm. almost out of the picture outside of nukes. Uh, there's a news story going around. They're deploying tanks ahead that haven't been used since World War II that are in museums. They're, they are now deploying those because they can't get the advanced tech for the new so Russia's almost, and America and Europe have an Achilles heel that can be neutralized in one stroke. Our technology is an Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. And that is if you had a global great EMP or a series of EMPs uh, that could turn the tide, shift the balance of power technologically real fast. Uh, yeah, you're, you're pre say pre-1980, pre-1979 technology would not be affected by an EMP uh, when you're talking about, you know, tanks and, you know, ar armored personnel carriers, uh, aircraft. Um, if Russia is already using, employing older tanks, yeah, I would imagine an EMP would have a, uh, direct effect on something like an, an M1 Abrams or a Humvee are uh, missile systems. So, you know, that's, you know, a very realistic scenario. You know, another scenario, in the global scenario, you could still have a global caliphate, but it would involve intrigue, manipulation. It would involve uh, using crafting methods to seize existing institutions redefine those institutions and if anyone doesn't think institutions can be refined just look at the culture war in the united states look at the institutions and think about what some of them represent now compared to what they used to represent yeah an example harvard was established originally to be a seminary yeah it is no longer a seminary and in fact, some commentators would argue that it's anti-Christian. I would argue that. I would argue that 99.99% 99 .99 of our universities are anti-Christian. A vast majority of them. I agree as well. I'm just using language that doesn't get us flagged. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, flag us. I don't know. Go ahead and flag us. Yeah, well, better to be flagged for the cause of Christ. You know, in our last slide here, it's talking about the little horn. And Pastor Chris, I, I'll let you read uh, the passages about the little horn. And then when you're done reading one, then I'll read the corresponding one from Beast of the Sea. All right. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. Daniel 7.25. Revelation 13.5, speaking great things and blasphemies. And the same horn made war with the saints. Daniel 
Revelation 13, 7. It was given unto him to make war with the saints. Shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Daniel 7, 25. Revelation 13, 7. War with the saints and to overcome them. More stout than his fellows. Daniel 7, 20. Revelation 13, 7. Power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. They shall be given into his hand. I think there was an issue with that slide. Yeah, I think I got cut off. off. Well, you get the point. There's a direct, you see a direct parallels between the little horn and the beast from the sea in Revelation. We can see then that these two prophetic writings are referencing the same individual. Yes. Uh, and there, there's more to be talked about the little horn. It, more revelation is given about the little horn in Daniel 8. When we start going in, into there, uh, one of the things that we're going to learn is that the little horn is the same as Satan's seat. Uh, and there's doubt, actually a double entendre going on. One part of it is it's a symbolism for Satan. Satan's activity on earth. Uh, and there's imagery of a third of the stars being drugged down, the demonic rebellion. But then the other side of it is that the little horn is referring to a nation that would be perceived as having little might. And when we get there, we're going to see that uh, manipulation and intrigue and craft is used to gain power and so uh that's another way that the, this antichrist system can come power we can get the global caliphate through massive war or we can get it through craft and intrigue and cloak and dagger right. either way we get to the antichrist here we get to the final beast coming out of the sea in the final form of the beast system so any concluding thoughts, Pastor Chris, as we leave this and prepare for uh, Revelation? Well, when I when I look at the look at this uh, text, uh, the way that I would interpret it is in the more local sense, in the vernacular that we put it, where it is a a new Babylon, a new Persia, and a new Greece. Right, a new say you could say a new Nebuchadnezzar, a new Cyrus, a, a new Alexander the Great, and it is a great war, and the beast that conquers all of it is a new caliphate, a global Islamic caliphate, and from that will be the little horn, which is the Antichrist. That would be that would be how the local version would play out, and Turkey and the Turkic people is just like. A spine hovering over uh, the other nations. We do have a, a Persia, Iran. We do have a Babylon, Iraq, mm -hmm. and Greece is also uh, a power in the world today. So all three of those nations are nations that exist, you know, in such a way that could make a local war possible if the Western civilization uh, and, and Russia and China got decimated through their own wars. In a power vacuum, you could have the local interpretation possible. Right. And of course, in a global interpretation, it would have um, England and the United States, Russia, Europe uh, coming together to form an entity like the United Nations. And in that scenario, you could have uh, some powerful nations from the Islamist world back a man who would be Secretary General of the United Nations and through craft take over. Right. So, and I think either either pathway is viable in today's climate. Either one could happen. Uh, it's a matter of waiting and seeing and it's a matter of us to be prepared and at the ready. Uh, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus and we have to be ready to give the testimony to Jesus a point to Jesus to show that we are in the last days. Now is the time to repent. Uh, and we are in very dangerous times through either war or intrigue. Uh, the ride's about to get rougher.
Yeah, it's about to get a lot, a lot rougher. If in the 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 uh, interpretation that I personally do not at all believe is the case, but where the lion is the is the English speaking world and the bear is Russia and the leopard is Germany and then the beast is the UN. In that interpretation, I could see where one could come to the conclusion that say Klaus Schwab is the Antichrist. I I could agree that he's probably some type of Antichrist. I mean, there's evil people everywhere. Yeah. Every path you go, every I mean, so you, you can find validity. And the, and the in, Bible teaches there are many antichrists. Uh, when we when we talk about the antichrist, it's simply the ultimate antichrist, the last in the line of many. Anyone who denies that Jesus is a Christ is an antichrist. With the antichrist being the ultimate version of all of that, um, as events converge into the final form of the world system uh the final form of organized opposition of jesus christ uh the configuration of kingdoms that christ meets when he returns to set his feet on the mount of olives to uh, set up his kingdom on earth when he comes down as the stone cut without hands that demolishes the whole world system and then grows to consume the whole world and set up god's kingdom on earth yeah, Klaus Schwab does seem like a bit of a movie Bond villain. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, there's you could come up with good arguments for any any of these interpretations of being valid, and the the way that I interpret it could be completely wrong. I could be completely wrong on this. Same here. I I do believe though. I, I mean, obviously, it's this is what I believe, so I believe it to be the most likely interpretation. Um, maybe I myself am guilty of looking at this through uh, a modern lens, but that's when I look at the text, this is what I see. But to sum up, what we can be certain is that Daniel's describing nations' future to his perspective, that there would be three nations that would arise uh they would have kingdoms in their own right and at the end of their battles through some series of events they become components of a composite fourth kingdom that uh, ends up having global control of the world and that out of that kingdom comes the antichrist and that at the end of this process we're going to see a one world religion and a one world government that's opposed to God and persecutes the people of God. And only to be destroyed by Jesus at his coming. You know, historically, even beyond the, the Roman persecutions, no other entity has persecuted Christians more than the Islamic world. That is, and that's precisely, we would see a, apocalyptic levels of persecution if the entire world became Islamic. Unimaginable. Uh, I once read 100 million. So the, the numbers uh, yeah. of Christians martyred by Islam rivals China, and which is a big deal considering that the Islamic world had only a small fraction of the people. But right. China had, and you know, anytime you're getting over 100 million, you're talking about a, a mega tyranny here. Any right, that's more people slaughtered than Hitler, and arguably more than Stalin, though the total number of people dying under that is right around that if you count the entire 70 years of, of Soviet, right? Well, that's you know. Stalin was at a much faster pace because the the Christian martyrs uh, from uh, Islamic persecution was over centuries. But now much of that persecution wasn't just persecution unto death. There was also Christians who were forced into slavery by the, for instance, the pirates of the Barbary Coast. 
um, the women that made up the harems were Christian women that were had been taken from coastal regions in Europe. Yeah, it's a, a, a state-sanctioned rape who is part of their toolkit. It still is. It's some, um, you know, the Taliban did that. We look at uh, we look at that little horn, and we start look that that being the Antichrist, and then we look from this. Just stay with me on this perspective. <laughs> get to the mark of the beast in the Book of Revelation. We talked about this privately. Um, when there is a a caliphate that is established, and then a caliph over it, that everyone. Um, <laughs> whether Muslim or not, has to swear allegiance to that caliph. That that could very well be what the mark of the beast is. It would certainly fit. Uh, the Greek word's karagma, and it refers to either a tattoo or some other marking sure. that would be put upon slaves to indicate who owned the slave. And so a component of that... One component is, is that the karagma indicates who your allegiance, who do you owe your allegiance to. In which case, that would be the allegiance to the Antichrist, to those who have the mark of the beast. To those who refuse to swear allegiance to the Antichrist, then they would refuse that mark. Uh, you know, that, that also fits because in, the, in, a, in a caliphate, everyone is a slave to the caliph whether free or slave or not, but due to one's loyalty, demanded loyalty, that your will is consistently subservient to that of the caliph, that in essence makes you a slave to the caliph. And of course, in contrast to the mark of God on those who know Jesus Christ, right. we refuse the mark of the beast because we have the mark of Jesus Christ yeah. and we're sealed with the Holy Spirit and we belong to the Lord, uh, you know. And so you, you have that component. Of course, the other component is what form does it take? And that will be a discussion we'll need to do at another time or whether the mark is some type of digital electronics or, or, or whether we should think more primitively uh, the when we get to that text, we're going to see that some there's some kind of media or medium or substrate that that marks over so that everybody knows who belongs to the beast and uh, something and it will be something that we'll be able to use to determine who can engage in commerce in the marketplace. Well, the market the mark of the beast wouldn't be something that would be thrust upon you against your will. You would willingly take it. Those who take it willingly take it. And it, and it involves worship. Because if you force it on people, then you don't know who has allegiance and who does not. So you, you would simply you'd create a scenario where people would be forced to give allegiance versus, you know, taking somebody, tying them to a gurney and just branding them. Right. Uh, and of course, in, in God's overarching supervision, the issue is who is Lord. And in that, everybody has to make a decision. Is Jesus Christ your ultimate allegiance? Or is there another allegiance that's higher than, than Christ? And everyone on earth will have to make the decision. No one will escape the necessity of it. There's not going to be any raffering out. There's not going to be a spaceship carting you away from the earth, teleporting you away from the earth so that you don't have to face the beast. Uh, those who are alive on the earth at that time will face that decision, and I believe it's not that far off. We're already seeing dry runs of things that are similar, that have already been thrust upon us uh, as a dry run to see what will people do. All right. Well, uh, I think we've, we've come to a good place to stop for this yes. for the night and uh we will pick back up next week uh in daniel 8 we're going to be talking about this or do we want to stay more into well seven let's, let's go ahead and finish seven okay.
let's go ahead and finish seven because uh but anyway let us uh bow our heads in prayer in closing heavenly father we come before you today in praise and thanksgiving we praise you for your many many blessings we pray that you use this message to open the minds and the hearts of those who see it be with each and every one of us as we go our separate ways and bring us back again safe next week we praise you now we praise you always for you alone are god in jesus name i pray in jesus name we pray and all god's people said amen